Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets regular, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does the star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Paul Levingood, president of the George C. Marshall Foundation. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone. Uh, please join me in another round of applause uh, for the Virginia Military Institute Color Guard. and our soloist, D.C. Washington. And we are also so pleased to have the Brass Quintet from the Virginia Military Institute with us this evening. They were playing during the reception, so how about a round of applause for them. Please take your seats. Well, it is a great honor to welcome you here on behalf of the George C. Marshall Foundation as we celebrate the many accomplishments of two remarkable Americans and present the 11th George C. Marshall Foundation Award to former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and the third George C. Marshall Foundation Humanitarian Award to the founder and CEO of Citadel, Ken Griffin. Now at Harvard University on June 5th, 1947, in an address that lasted a mere 11 minutes, Secretary of State George C. Marshall offered a startling idea that was completely at odds with the way victorious nations had behaved in the wake of virtually every war in human history. In the months following that speech, he played a major role in winning public and congressional support for the legislation that created the European Recovery Program in 1948, better known by the architect's name, the Marshall Plan. So it was that 17 European countries were rebuilt with more than $13 billion in U.S. economic and technical assistance. That support helped foster both economic and political stability. Now this was crucial to the creation and survival of the free institutions, conditions that ended the cycle of destructive war that had ravaged Europe 
for centuries. This magnanimity, coupled with keen strategic vision, were hallmarks of our namesake, George C. Marshall. More than any other individual, we owe the peace and prosperity of the Western world over the past seven decades to this great and good man. I welcome you tonight on behalf of the George C. Marshall Foundation and its board of trustees, many of whom are here. Through its research library, archives, and educational programs, the foundation is the place where the values that shaped and motivated Marshall are kept alive. Our intention is to ensure George C. Marshall, the man who won the war and won the peace, remains in the forefront of public consciousness as the paradigm of selfless service and unassailable integrity so that new leaders of all ages can learn from his example. And I would ask you, when has the world ever needed leadership like Marshall's? Your support this evening and in the future makes possible all the work we do to promote his towering example. We're honored to have so many friends of the Marshall Foundation here this evening. If you all might indulge me for just a few minutes, please allow me to thank several organizations and individuals who have helped bring about this incredible event. And please hold your applause till the end. Thank you to our five-star sponsors, Citadel LLC, and Catherine Farley and Jerry Spire. Our three-star sponsors, Virginia Military Institute, VMI Alumni Agencies, and the Yance family. Our two-star sponsors, Cliffwater, Henry Repeating Arms, Greg Robertson, and Sigler Guff. And our one-star sponsors, Chevron Corporation, Aaron Krantz Partners, Mr. and Mrs. Russell Fletcher, Mr. and Mrs. John Kleinheinz, Price Waterhouse Coopers, Ropes and Gray LLP, Skadden Arps, Slate, Meager, and Flom LLP, and the VMI Alumni Chapter, New York City, Long Island. Thank you all for your generous support of the Marshall Foundation. Just a couple of individuals I'd also like to recognize for their attendance this evening. The Superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute, Major General Cedric T. Wins. <laughs> Representative Michael Waltz of Florida's 6th District. <laughs> and Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Jason Miares. We appreciate you all taking time from your schedule to be with us. And it is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's Master of Ceremonies, Peggy Noonan. Ms. Noonan is a political columnist at the Wall Street Journal, where her weekly column, Declarations, has been enjoyed by all of us for more than 20 years. In 2016, she became the first woman and first writer to receive the Pilgrim's USA Medallion of Service to the nation. She has been recipient of the Columnist of the Year Award by The Week magazine, the New York Women in Communications Award of Excellence, the Union League Club's Abraham Lincoln Literary Award, the Bicentennial Medal of Mount St. Mary's University, and the Congressional Medal of Honor Society's Award for Excellence in Media. In 2017, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Commentary, the citation praising her for, quote, rising to the moment with beautifully rendered columns that connected readers to the shared virtues of Americans during one of the nation's most divisive political campaigns. She is the author of nine books on American politics, history, and culture, including the bestsellers, What I Saw at the Revolution, When Character Was King, and John Paul the Great. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peggy Noonan. Thank you, Paul, uh, very much. Um, after such a marvelous introduction, even I'm interested in what I'm going to say. I stole that from Henry Kissinger. Just so you know, that's how he begins. Um, I always say I don't deserve uh, those very kind words, but then I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either, so what the heck. Um, I accepted this invitation with great enthusiasm a few months ago, because I too honor 
George C. Marshall and have considered him for a long time to be a not, a not fully celebrated uh, figure in our political and historical life. And I say this even though his name is on one of the most stirring, most triumphantly American foreign policy achievements of the 20th century, the Marshall Plan, though he did not tend to call it that himself. But that's how it became known, in part because the journalists of those days were keen to capture the essence of things in the naming of things. Anyway, it was us as a nation at our best to sacrifice to win a war and then sacrifice to help many of those we had defeated. There was no sharp and obvious public mood when the war ended to spend more in energy and commitment and treasure to establish a durable peace. Uh, in the end, I believe it was Harry Truman and George C. Marshall who did it, who led public sentiment and garnered public support day by day. The former, Harry Truman, through political commitment and calling in some chits and using who he was, and the latter, General Marshall, Marshall I would say through sheer and unquestionable stature. So when I get a chance to be part of honoring him, I take it. I am also here because I honor Ms. Condi Rice, Dr. Rice, Professor Rice, Director Rice, NSC Advisor Rice, Secretary of State Rice, I wish I could say President Rice. And she knows I feel that way. Emails go back and forth in which I urge her on. Now she owns the Bronco, so I think it'll never happen. Um, that's also a hard job. Uh, I have known her and been awed by her for almost 20 years. And we mark this evening, too, the generosity and seriousness of purpose of Ken Griffin of Citadel and Citadel Securities, who uses his success in the world in a wholly publicly, public-spirited and publicly engaged way, in a serious way, including generously supporting supporting good organizations like this. Now, I have been instructed that my job here this evening is a modest one. It is to herd cats, also to keep the trains running, also to make sure the cats don't stray onto the tracks. I will do my best, and so we begin. It is my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Barbara Woodward, Great Britain's permanent representative to the United Nations. You know of her many achievements, Britain's ambassador to the People's Republic of China from 2015 through 2020. She has worked, as, uh, she has worked on the security and economic aspects of foreign policy in China and Russia as well as in the EU and at the UN in Geneva. She is an OBE and a CMG, and we think she's more than A-OK. -okay. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Barbara Woodward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking you, Peggy, for those very kind words, uh, and also thanking the chairman and the president of the Marshall Foundation for the honor you've done me by inviting you to join you uh, this evening. It is indeed uh, a great honor to join you uh, in this year, the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. And it's a pleasure, too, and an honor 
to honor distinguished Americans with Marshall Foundation's awards. Awards which recognize the selfless service, the dedicated effort, and the strength of character of their founder. In fact, that epitomizes, of course, the values, principles, and legacy of George Marshall, who we've already heard about this evening. As he set out to overcome, as he put it in his 1947 11-minute Harvard lecture, hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos, and in doing so, to build a bullock against communism's advance. In short, as we've heard, having won the war, to ensure that the US and its allies, including the UK, also won the peace. The Marshall Plan, or as we've heard more formally, the European Recovery Plan, was quite simply, as President Truman said, one of America's greatest contributions to the peace of the world. Now, we in Britain were grateful and, I have to say, ready recipients of Marshall funding, and admittedly after some discussion and negotiation. Under Churchill's legendary leadership, we too were victors in the Second World War. But victory had come at a very high price. Our soldiers, sailors, and airmen, the lucky ones who returned, including my late father, returned to a war-ravaged country. The German Luftwaffe had bombed our major cities, perhaps best known among them, London and Coventry. We had kept our supply of arms at the front, thanks to America's Lend-Lease program. But the pound, the pound sterling, was flailing as a reserve currency. We faced, as economist John Maynard Keynes said, a financial Dunkirk. And as the euphoria of victory died down, people across Britain wanted a helping hand to rebuild their lives and communities. And the Beveridge Report, which led to the establishment of the UK's now legendary National Health Service and social welfare system were post-war priorities for the UK. And that is where we invested our very generous share of the Marshall Fund. Stabilize the pound and thus our own economy, to set up our National Health Service and to re-equip our military. In short, to get back on our feet as a global power. The pound remains one of the world's top reserve currencies. London ranks second only to New York as a global financial center. And our National Health Service, celebrated in Danny Boyle's opening ceremony for our Olympic Games in 2012, remains a source of national pride and international distinction. UK is, after the United States, the second largest contributor to NATO and the largest European contributor. Now, of course, the Marshall Plan was not the whole story. There were other elements too. But I think the key point is that by 1975, less than 30 years after the Marshall Plan was launched, when the seven most industrialized nations met, the group we now know as the G7, they included four Marshall Plan recipients. And that was, of course, alongside the United States, the founder of the Marshall Plan, and with Canada and Japan. But there was more than that. The Marshall Plan has become a byword for a plan which delivers both immediate and enduring success. We have, of course, heard calls for a Marshall Plan for development, a Marshall Plan for climate, and most recently, a Marshall Plan for Ukraine, when, and I say when, not if, when Russia has been finally defeated and the war is over. <laughs> so what then is it about the Marshall Plan that remains so relevant today when the world today 
is in many ways so different from the world of 1947. Three things strike me as both critical to the Marshall Plan's success and enduring legacy and relevant today. First, George Marshall's plan put people at the heart of national decisions. At his speech in Harvard in 1947, setting out the Marshall Plan, while his overriding aim was to reduce Europe's vulnerability to communism, his approach was to tackle the root causes of that vulnerability to communism. The poverty, the hunger, the despair, the chaos that had been left behind after World War II. The Marshall Plan took a whole of society approach. It relied on government planning, on business and entrepreneurship, and it created jobs and scholarships for individuals. And it worked. Britain got back on its feet, and British people were very moved by Marshall's impact in the UK. I've heard that 70 years ago in 1953, when Marshall entered Westminster Cathedral for Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II's coronation, the entire congregation, and that's over 2,000 people, you saw Westminster Cathedral again at Her Late Majesty's funeral, over 2,000 people rose to their feet and the orchestra played in Marshall's honor. His humility, George Marshall turned around to see which VIP had entered. He didn't realize until the following day that that tribute had been for him. As the world population crossed 8 billion earlier this week, and it was about 2.5 billion in 1947. It must, I think, remain an enduring principle that each one of those 8 billion lives matters. We're reminded of that in the beautiful words which opened Kofi Annan's moving address when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the United Nations in 2001. He said, today in Afghanistan, a girl will be born. Her mother will hold her and feed her, comfort her and care for her, just as any mother would anywhere in the world. In these most basic acts of human nature, humanity knows no divisions. And that pledge too is reflected in the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, to leave no one behind. When we take decisions which are based on dignity and respect for the individual, we are building the base of our future success. Marshall did just that. When we forget that common humanity, and it has been forgotten and trampled too many times in history, we cannot build something that endures as the Marshall Plan did. Secondly, George Marshall recognized the link between domestic and foreign policy. He knew that without getting the countries of Europe to trust one another again, to work with each other again, the prospects for the future of the US, of the UK, and 17 other European countries were bleak. So by encouraging European unity and cooperation and recognizing the need for economic and security alliances to work hand in hand, the Marshall Plan sowed the seeds of many of the international institutions that define modern diplomacy today. And this has also defined our joint response to Ukraine with allies across Europe and beyond. And I think that legacy is even more relevant today when more and more of the problems we face are transnational, they do not respect national boundaries. We saw that through 2020. Countries were ravaged individually by COVID, but our response succeeded when we collaborated on vaccine development and distribution, for example. And on climate change, we face a global challenge that we can solve only with a combination 
of national and international measures. Responses, of course, are based on national measures, nationally determined contributions, but they also recognize that emissions, fires, floods, storms, cross borders, they are at once national and international challenges, and that's what our response needs to be too. In short, we are stronger together. Thirdly, that there is truly something special about a special relationship with the United States. The U.S. defense partnership is the strongest in the world. UK is the US's largest trading partner in the world. And as permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, we work very closely together to protect international peace and security. Although I have to say many times in the last nine months, going into the Security Council feels a bit like going into battle, especially with the information war being raged by Russia. But thanks to the seating arrangement around that famous horseshoe being in alphabetical order, I know that next to me, each time I have in Linda Thomas Greenfield, an ally and a friend. And like all the best partnerships and friendships, the UK-US relationship is underpinned by shared values, freedom, democracy, and trust. And we look forward to continuing that special relationship let me say in conclusion that the Marshall Plan was time limited, another of its important attributes, but the goodwill and the partnership it has generated were not time limited. In 1988, UK created Marshall Scholarships to honor George Marshall's historic vision and to offer the best and brightest American students the opportunity to study at some of the UK's world-renowned universities. Today, there are thousands of Marshall alumni, some of whom have gone on to be Supreme Court justices, CEOs, members of Congress, astronauts, Oscar nominees, and winners of Nobel Prizes and Pulitzer Prizes. But for all that, the two Marshall Foundation awardees that we honor this evening stand out even in that distinguished company. It is a great honor to join you this evening to celebrate the outstanding contributions of Condoleezza Rice and Ken Griffin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Woodward, for those important and very timely remarks. Um, we are going to hear an invocation, and then we are going to have dinner and come back with the program after dinner. But at this time, I would like to welcome Chaplain Robert Phillips to the stage to offer this evening's invocation. Good evening. In 1944, George C. Marshall wrote a letter to a classroom of students in Roanoke, Virginia. And he said, the most important factor of all is character, which involves integrity, unselfish and devoted purpose, a sturdiness of bearing when everything goes wrong, and a willingness to sacrifice self in the interest of the common good. I believe it is in this spirit that we gather this evening and in this spirit that I invite you to join me in the invocation. Our Father, tonight we gather in the spirit of gratitude as we celebrate the heritage and the legacy of George C. Marshall. On this 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, we realize that many of our Western freedoms, American values, and ideals of democracy were influenced and shaped by the vision and contributions of General Marshall. We offer our heartfelt thanks for Secretary Rice and Mr. Griffin 
whose individual lives and careers have continuously reflected the spirit, character, service, and leadership modeled by General Marshall. We recognize their devotion to duty, their selfless sacrifice, and the integrity with which they have committed their lives to the public good. May that spirit of character and humility and humanitarian service permeate this room tonight. May every one of us feel it. May we be inspired by it. May we embrace it. And may we be driven in the core of our souls to embrace it, to em emulate it. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be here this evening. We offer thanks for the meal and for all who have contributed to this evening's festivities. May we leave here this evening better equipped to serve the common good. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. I am delighted now to introduce Gerald Beeson, who is the Chief Operating Officer, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, at Citadel. He looks after the firm's uh, corporate functions globally before becoming CEO, COO in 2008. He was Citadel's Chief Financial Officer. Here's something nice and always rather moving. He joined the company in 1993 as an intern, was among the company's very first employees, and worked his way up. He is a busy man. We're lucky he's here. And so, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> please welcome Gerald Beeson to speak about Ken Griffin. Thank you, Peggy. But she also left a post-it note here that said that Marshall's speech to Harvard was 11 minutes, make yours five. <laughs> it's such a privilege to be here this evening, to be here with all of you to celebrate the legacy of, of George Marshall, and to recognize two deserving individuals who continue to emulate many of the qualities that made him such a story leader and a great American. On behalf of the partners in Citadel and Citadel Securities, I had the distinct honor to introduce one of those individuals this evening, my business partner and colleague of nearly 30 years, Ken Griffin. As Peggy said, I met Ken when I was an intern at Citadel in 1993. He was 24 years old at the time. His firm was about two and a half years post-launch with $4.6 million of capital and two employees. What struck me about Ken at that point in time, even from those earliest days, was the clarity in terms of his clear vision for the type of firm that he wanted to build and what he thought about that firm could play in the world of finance. So two months prior to graduation, I had intended to go off and start my career in public accounting. Ken called me into his office and he encouraged me to build my career at Citadel instead. And he said to me, we're building something truly different here. So looking back, I don't think that either of us could have possibly appreciated what that would mean for our firm or how emblematic that approach is to Ken's leadership from a civic and a business standpoint. Fast forward nearly 30 years, Ken has had one of the most remarkable careers in the history of finance. He's built Citadel into one of the world's leading investment firms and Citadel Securities into the world's leading market maker. But what is equally, if not more impressive, is the impact that Ken has had outside of Citadel's four walls. So in preparing for this evening, I came across a quote from George Marshall about the importance of US support for the rebuilding of Europe. And in that quote, he said, democracy is the most demanding of all forms of government in terms of the energy, the imagination, and the public spirit required of the individual. And I was struck by this quote because these qualities of energy, imagination, and the commitment to public service are what makes Ken such a unique and accomplished leader. In his early years, Ken was an entrepreneur who was wearing many hats in a growing firm and basically working around the clock. But he still made time to tutor students in Chicago's South Side in math each week. And as Citadel's commercial success grew over the course of the years, so did Ken's deep appreciation for what it meant to be a civic leader. And throughout his career, he has forged relationships with civic leaders and actively sought opportunities to drive significant change at the local, 
the national and increasingly on the international scale as well. And Ken's passion for making that difference that began in those early tutoring sessions has now grown into a lifelong commitment to philanthropy and to civic leadership. And to date, he's given more than a billion and a half dollars to drive catalytic change across five key priorities. First, a focus to improve education at all levels. And that means not just in terms of in the classroom, but also providing students with the support that they need and the tools that they need to be successful academically and as they build their professional careers. Second, in terms of accelerating and pushing the scientific frontier in medicine to produce better outcomes over the years to come for millions of people. Third, a focus on advancing freedom and democracy by protecting free speech, promoting civic engagement, and championing the free market system. Fourth, the focus to expand access to the American dream and provide opportunities for more people to reach their own true potential. And finally, strengthening communities by enhancing cultural institutions and public spaces and by reducing crime and improving public safety. Now, Ken's approach in each of these areas is unique because it's driven by many of the same core principles that have empowered the success in his business career as well. It's a focus on data-driven, scalable opportunities that are evaluated in measurable, specific outcomes. And he leverages that business experience by looking for transformative solutions. He's not deterred in the least by taking on problems that some may say are impossible to solve because ultimately, if you look at his career, there's been a number of different times when this has been demonstrated, but perhaps no other time where that resolve has been demonstrated quite as acutely as it was during the recent pandemic. One of the extraordinary examples of this resolve is how quickly he mobilized the partners of Citadel in the early days of COVID when he learned that one of our colleagues was stranded in Wuhan with her family. And upon hearing that there might not be enough space for our colleague and her family on the single flight that the United States had procured to bring citizens home from Wuhan, he reached out to then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And once Ken learned how many Americans there were that needed to come home, we worked closely with the State Department to bring multiple flights and to fund multiple flights that ultimately brought home more than 800 Americans to safety. Another one of Ken's notable contributions was laying the groundwork for what would become ultimately Operation Warp Speed. And he passionately advocated for the government to create vaccine demand so that pharmaceutical companies could invest in production even before the vaccines had been approved. And this push dramatically accelerated the ability to produce and reduce our time to market after the vaccines were approved and ultimately drove vaccinations to tens of millions of Americans far in advance of when it likely would have occurred otherwise. Ken also stepped up during the pandemic when he became aware that hundreds of thousands of students have been sent home for remote learning and didn't have the fundamental key of, of having access to the internet to be able to do their remote learning. And he moved quickly to combine a public and private partnership, both Chicago Connected and Miami Connected, to provide no cost, high speed at home broadband to underserved public school students. Building on this work, he has since supported a national initiative that leverages federal resources to close the broadband affordability gap. And finally tonight, I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on Ken's generous support of our armed forces. Recognizing and reflecting his long-standing commitment to those who have served our country with honor, he provided the largest grant to the Navy SEALs Foundation ever in 2020. This gift supported the foundation's resiliency programs for children of SEALs and also provided educational opportunities for SEALs to pursue higher education as well. There are so many other examples, both large and small, time and time again, of how Ken has demonstrated deep commitment to both civic and philanthropic leadership. Much like George Marshall, he is not afraid to tackle seemingly impossible challenges, and his energy and the relentless pursuit of innovative solutions have made a lasting impact on countless lives. Ken, I'm proud to call you a partner and a friend. And thank you for the example you provide to us all, and congratulations tonight on receiving this year's George C. Marshall Foundation Humanitarian Award. Thank you, Gerald, for those thoughtful remarks. We now invite to the stage Ken Griffin, 
who will be joined by Russ Fletcher, chairman of the Marshall Foundation Board of Trustees, and Paul Levengood, who you, whom you've already met. Come on up. I'm going to read the award citation. Kenneth C. Griffin, you are being honored today for your extraordinary philanthropy and for the effects of your generosity on the lives of countless individuals. A native of Boca Raton, Florida, you are a 1989 graduate of Harvard College. As a student, you showed a true passion for investing and merely one year later founded Citadel, which you have guided to become one of the world's most successful alternative investment firms. In addition, you and your partners at Citadel also founded Citadel Securities and built it into one of the world's largest market makers. It has been said, what we keep, we lose. Only what we give remains our own. You have lived this maxim through your remarkable record of philanthropic support, of education at every level, medical research, crime reduction, support of the veteran community, and the preservation of our national patrimony. This investment in your fellow Americans and citizens of the world exceeds the $1.5 billion mark and continues to grow. Like George C. Marshall, you have excelled as a strategic thinker, a problem solver, a visionary, and a champion of human potential. Like General Marshall, also, you have worked thoughtfully and innovatively to ensure that citizens of the American Republic are better informed about the history and potential of this great land. We are honored, therefore, to present you with the George C. Marshall Foundation Humanitarian Award on this date, November 17th, 2022 in New York City. Good evening. It is such an honor to be with you tonight to celebrate the legacy of George C. Marshall. Words cannot express how honored I am to receive this award. Russ and Paul, thank you for chairing tonight's event. And I'm grateful to you and everyone at the Marshall Foundation. Gerald, I so appreciate the kind introduction tonight. We have worked together for almost 30 years. I'll share a bit of a personal story about Gerald. I did offer him the opportunity to work at Sale about two months before he graduated from college. His professor, who had secured for him a job at Deloitte, was pretty angry. He told Gerald he was throwing his career away. Now, there is a scholarship in his professor's name. <laughs> at the university that Gerald went to, where Gerald is now on the Board of Trustees. <laughs> but the most touching part of the story is Gerald had to tell his father, who was a Chicago police officer. Gerald was the first in the family to go to college. And he'd tell his dad, I was going to turn down Deloitte to work for somebody who was 24. And his dad said, well, we have given you a college education. You must know what you're doing. So I'm very fortunate to have you with me tonight, Gerald, and I'm also fortunate to be joined by a number of my partners from Citadel, including Peng Chao, who runs Citadel Securities, and Pablo, who co-runs the hedge fund with me. It is a privilege to be surrounded by so many of my friends that I work with each and every day, who I'm blessed to have as my partners. I would also like to congratulate Secretary Rice, and much like George Marshall, you served our nation during a time of great need. Your distinguished career public service is an example to all of us. And thank you to everyone else who's made this evening possible. Peggy Noonan, whose work I love to read. Ambassador Woodward gave a fantastic speech. And we are so, so fortunate to have the UK as our closest ally. Washington, or DC Washington, and of course the Color Guard from Virginia Military Institute, just to name a few. Now this, the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, we celebrate the plan's role providing the economic and humanitarian 
foundations for the rebirth of war-torn Europe. George Marshall recognized that the economic security interests of Europe and the United States are inextricably linked. And through his plan, he fought for the core promise of democracy, the right to self-governance and personal freedom for so many around the world. Now, it is hard to believe that Europe is once again at war. Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has been a catastrophe. The loss of life is unimaginable, and Europe faces significant challenges. Much like in the aftermath of World War II, we must refocus on steps that we can take to help our allies across the Atlantic. A unique dimension of this current conflict is the weaponization of energy. In Europe and across the world, we are all suffering from the consequences of dependency on Russian fuels. In contrast to Europe, though, the United States could be energy independent. We have the technological and geological resources to meet not only our demands for energy, but the demands of Europe for energy. And with our resources, there is no excuse for the U.S. to be held hostage to any foreign country when it comes to energy independence. We have seen from the Marshall Plan the significant mutual benefits of cooperation between the U.S. and Europe on trade. Between our two continents, we should further ease impediments to trade, reducing barriers, reducing tariffs, this would support growth in both of our continents, and growth is much needed. It would also help to encourage capital formation, and both countries need to build for a better tomorrow. What has been particularly frustrating has been the rise of trade and tariff policies as geopolitical tools to gain leverage on non-trade issues. One example was President Barack Obama's threat to the UK that they would be at the end of the queue with a trade deal for America if they committed to Brexit. With regard to America's greatest economic rival, China, the US continues to take an increasingly aggressive stance on trade. For example, last month, the United States advanced legislation that makes it difficult, in fact, impossible to export to China advanced semiconductor and supercomputer manufacturing technologies. Now, at the most fundamental level, this policy shift elevates national security above economic efficiency. It aims to achieve as large as a lead as possible over China in critical technology areas, which are key for military dominance, even if it comes at a cost for US firms. Now, while the virtues of this position may seem self-evident in the current environment of rising geopolitical tension, and it may delay China's progress in the very near term, there are significant long-term consequences. America's position will undoubtedly accelerate China's quest for technological independence from the West. All of us in America should be concerned about China's ability to compete with us in this dimension. China's rise will induce countries across developing economies in Africa, South America, and Asia to embrace technology with a Made in China label. The consequences of this should ring with clarity far and wide throughout the halls of Washington, DC. The potential implications from the dominance of Chinese technology and semiconductors is not an abstract talking point. We've already seen the rise of Chinese telecommunications technology. Last year, Huawei, a Chinese telecom company, finalized more 5G network contracts than any other country in the world. Huawei has built nearly 70% of Africa's 4G network and is well positioned to build out 5G across the continent. America's technological leadership is not a foregone conclusion and a technologically fragmented world undermines the global impact and leadership of both the United States and Europe. This is particularly chilling to consider when China ranks third in military exports behind the United States and Russia, and they are well positioned to expand their market share. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge one of George Marshall's strengths as a leader, his focus on quick and decisive action. He has been quoted as saying, the choice is between acting with energy 
or losing by default. In the economic competition between the West and China, we will secure a stronger future by acting with energy to prepare tomorrow's leaders rather than implementing short-term protectionist policies. This is why investing in education at home has never been more important. As our country emerges from COVID-19, we face an existential crisis. The biggest loss is the loss of learning for our children. Unfortunately, this loss has been greatest amongst Latin and black communities and low-income households. In response, we must commit to teaching our students critical thinking skills instead of engaging in culture wars in classrooms. By closing the digital divide, working to increase instruction time, scaling tutoring, and greatly enhancing our emphasis on early literacy, math, and science, we can educate the generation who will lead America into the digital future. We must not lose sight of the fact that China graduates roughly four times as many STEM graduates as we do here in the United States. We have witnessed a realigning of global interest this year following Russia's invasion of the Ukraine and the acute economic impact of poorly considered policies. At a time like this, Marshall's legacy of economic and humanitarian cooperation and the United States' role in advancing these ideas have never been more relevant. Thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Ken, congratulations to you. I think those were important remarks, uh, especially within the current world context. Um, now, I introduce Stephen Hadley. You know him well. He is a principal of Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel, an international strategic consulting firm founded with Rice, Gates, Hadley, and Manuel. Um, Stephen is executive vice chair of the board of directors uh, at the Atlantic Council, and he's the former board chair of the United States Institute of Peace, where he serves on the board of directors. He served four years as the assistant to the president for national security affairs. Prior to that, assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor to Condi Rice. He has also been an Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. And so please, a hearty welcome to the distinguished Stephen Hadley. Thank you, Peggy. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Levengood for and the Marshall Foundation for hosting this very special evening. It is a great honor to be here and to have the opportunity to pay tribute to my dear friend and colleague, Secretary Condoleezza Rice. Tonight we commemorate the anniversary of the Marshall Plan and honor the individuals who have continued to uphold George Marshall's vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. You have made a greater contribution to that end than Condoleezza Rice. During her service at the National Security Council staff for President George H.W. Bush, Condi was a crucial, crucial player in bringing a peaceful end to the Cold War and setting the stage for a unified Germany firmly aligned with the West. As National Security Advisor, Secretary of State under President George W. Bush, Condi led the effort to establish a constructive relationship with Russia, while at the same time strengthening the NATO alliance and expanding its membership as a hedge against the emergence of a revanchist Russia that we are regrettably seeing today. 
Having worked with or observed up close most of the national security advisors and secretary of states over the last five decades, and I am that old, I can tell you that Condoleezza Rice was one of the most effective. And it was not just because of her smarts, stamina, and diplomatic skills, though she has these in great abundance. But Condi realized, as did Henry Kissinger, Brent Scowcroft, George Schultz, James Baker, and Madeleine Albright before her, that the power and influence of these positions derives from a relationship of confidence and trust with the president. And Condi had such a relationship with George W. Bush. Bush put it this way, from the, our first meeting, she struck me as someone I could trust for honest advice based on extensive knowledge and careful thinking. She could explain the details of Balkan history while hiking up a steep hill at our ranch without missing a beat and without missing a step. That is Condi Rice. Condi was also fearless and despite her legendary grace and charm, could be incredibly tough. When Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in 2008 told her that Russia's objectives in inv invading Georgia now included toppling its democratically elected president, Condi told La Lavrov that she intended to tell the world about this, and she did. When Lavrov protested that his comment had been made in confidence, told him flatly, Sergei, Secretary of State of the United States does not have a private conversation with the Russian foreign minister about overthrowing a democratically elected president. <laughs> Her very public exposure of Lavrov's comment saved the Georgian government from overthrow. That also is Condi. Upon leaving the role of Secretary of State, Condi returned to academia and to Stanford University. And she had not lost her touch as an academic. After writing No Higher Honor, a memoir of her years in Washington, and Extraordinary Ordinary People, a tribute to her remarkable parents and upbringing in segregated Birmingham, she tackled subjects as diverse as political risk analysis, the end of the Cold War, and the advance of democracy. Her book, entitled simply Democracy, is a staunch defense of democratic governance and political freedom at a time when many are attracted by seemingly more effective authoritarian alternatives. The book shows vividly that the pursuit of democracy is a continuing and unending struggle. Whether the task is to oppose authoritarian regimes, to build the institutions of a new young democracy, or to reform mature democracies to better live up to their ideals. As Walter Isaacson said, everyone should read this book. It will restore your faith in our nation's creed and remind you of the nobility of our mission in this world. That is Condi Rice, too. As director of the Hoover Institution at Stanford, Condi has launched the Center for the Revitalization of American Institutions. This bold initiative seeks to better understand the crisis of confidence that grips our nation and to develop recommendations for revitalizing American institutions and reconnecting with its people. This, that is Condi Rice, a public figure, a national treasure, continuing to serve our great country. But at a personal level, Condi is also one of the most remarkable people any of us will ever meet. Her multiple talents are legendary, an avid golfer, inveterate sports fan, talented concert pianist, accomplished author, organizational change maker, and a public speaker who would get a standing ovation just by reading the phone book. 
And if you had a chance to attend one of Condi's Christmas parties while she was Secretary of State, you saw this diversity on display. Along with powerful political figures, there was her golf pro, her strength trainer, her string quartet, friends going all the way back to Birmingham, and of course, the beloved Aunt G. A world of friends and family that Condi wisely holds close. But in the end, it is her character that impresses most. Her strong religious faith sustains her in the face of hardship and motivates her to give back to the community. A figure of national prominence, Condi always has the time went for an approaching stranger who just wants a picture or to shake her hand. She understands with Aretha Franklin that R-E-S-P-E-C-T is the coin of the realm and she accords it to everyone she meets. That is my friend, Condoleezza Rice. Stephen, thank you uh, for those keenly insightful and very human observations. All I will add personally is hear, hear, and ditto. You all know what is distinguished, remarkable, deeply admirable about Condi Rice. You know her history. I will only say that when you have profound personal grace plus keen intellect, plus high character, plus a spine of steel, well, that can be a rather powerful thing in the world. And so it is my pleasure to invite to the stage the most powerful woman I know, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice, you have been a professor, an author, a businesswoman, and a public servant. From 2001 to 2005, you were the assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, National Security Advisor. And from 2005 to 2009, you served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States, thereby becoming the first black woman to hold either position. You are a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the recipient of more than 15 honorary degrees recognizing both your academic achievement and your commitment to this nation. Your example of determination, grace, and keen intellect has been an inspiration to your fellow Americans. Dr. Rice, in 1997, the George C. Marshall Foundation established an award to commemorate the 50th anniversary of General Marshall's announcement of a program for European recovery which soon became known as the Marshall Plan. As you know, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the commencement of this massive enterprise on behalf of Western Europe. This evening, we ask you to accept this award. You are being recognized for a career dedicated to public service, and in particular, you are being honored for your efforts in the noble tradition of your predecessor, Secretary of State George C. Marshall. Oh my, I'm rarely speechless, but uh, I, I want first of all to thank my dear, dear friend Stephen Hadley. Uh, you know how important it is to have people in the trenches with you who share your values and who have your back. And throughout the eight years that we were together in the Bush administration and the couple of years together in the administration of George H.W. Bush, uh, there was never a more honorable public servant than Stephen Hadley. Stephen, thank you for your service.
congratulations uh, to my co-recipient, Ken Griffin. Uh, the list of your philanthropic activities is just remarkable, but I think what we could fill in uh, the citation to you and in the remarks made about you is that you just have a really big heart, and I am so grateful to share this stage with you tonight. <laughs> Ambassador Woodward, you honor us with your, with your presence and with your remarks about what the Marshall Plan meant. Because I think that for Americans, uh, we know what George C. Marshall meant to us. To hear it from a friend and a lie, thank you. And thank you for your marvelous service to democracy while you were in China and now at the United Nations. I'm honored to share the stage with you as well. To Paul, love and good, and to the Fletchers, thank you for your stewardship of this wonderful foundation and for this terrific, tasty dinner that we've enjoyed. And to my good friend, Peggy Noonan. You know, I have to tell you that uh, the Wall Street Journal asked me to write a little piece about what it meant to be living through COVID. And uh, I talked about uh, the isolation that one might feel and so forth. But the one thing that I said when asked, what are you reading? I said simply, Peggy Noonan. Peggy, thank you for your grace and thank you for sharing your tremendous talent with us. I am uh, deeply, deeply honored to receive this award particularly on the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. You know, every day when I went to the State Department as uh, the Secretary of State, I would walk along a corridor that we called Mahogany Row. And along that corridor were the portraits of former Secretaries of State, some of them who you wouldn't be able to pick out of the lineup of one because they've long since disappeared from our history. A few that you wondered why they were still there, like that horrific portrait of John C. Calhoun, who actually tried to destroy the country. And then I would keep walking, and I would walk into my office where the pride of place was for George C. Marshall's portrait. And I could often stand in front of that portrait and wonder what it might have been like for him and for the people of the State Department in those rather dark days after the end of World War II. We forget that just before Marshall would become Secretary of State, in 1946, the Italian communist would win 48% of the vote and the French communist, 46% of the vote. The question wasn't, would Eastern Europe be communist? It was, would Western Europe be communist? Of course, Marshall would respond in 1947 by this remarkable idea, an idea of enlightened self-interest, that by rebuilding both friend, who had been victorious, and foe, who had been vanquished, that we would make the world not just safer and better for them, but safer and better for us. Marshall would, of course, go on to face other challenges as Secretary of State, the Berlin crisis of 1948, the coup in Czechoslovakia that would take the last free country into the Soviet bloc in 1948, the outbreak of war, in the Middle East. Of course, in 1949, the Soviet Union would explode a nuclear weapon five years ahead of schedule. The Chinese Communists would win, and Marshall would be called back to service when the Korean War broke out as Secretary of Defense. Who would have thought that those dark days, who would have thought that the response to those dark days would end in 1989 to 1991, when I was fortunate to be the young 
Soviet specialist for the White House. It would end in 1989 with the liberation of Eastern Europe, the unification of Germany in 1990 completely and totally on Western terms. In fact, West Germany would emerge the state, the successor state, East Germany would simply disappear. And in 1991, the Soviet Union would collapse. In 2007, an American president would go to a NATO summit in Latvia. Who would have ever dreamed that in 46 or 47 or 48 or 49 or 50? Maybe not even in 60 or 70 or 80. But you see, because of the wisdom and the strength of Marshall and others like him in those days after World War II, the understanding of enlightened self-interest, the understanding that democracy matters, that compassion matters in the lives of people, the understanding that allies matter. Because of that, we harvested those great decisions in 1989, 1990, and 1991 to help create a Europe whole, free, and at peace. But I have to say that in 1991, we would never have imagined the world in which we live today, a world in which war has returned to Europe. And not just war of the kind that we might have thought, fought somehow in cyberspace or uh, fought somehow with advanced weapons. No, instead, a ground war in Europe in the service of imperial ambitions of a once great power. As we face that world that we could not have imagined in 1991, as we face that world that we now need the kind of leadership that Marshall provided, I would suggest that we look back and we think again on what made it possible for Marshall to do what he did. First and foremost, it was the character of the man. It was also the experience of the man with war to recognize that out of war could come peace. But an understanding that a peace had to be just. And if a peace was going to be just, it meant that men and women had to live in freedom because no one deserved to live in tyranny. But to understand that if men and women were to be free and to have the right to choose those who would govern them, they would expect that those who would govern them would also deliver for them. And that was the genius of the Marshall Plan, to allow those democracies to get up off the mat, deliver for their people, and become strong and vital friends of the United States once again. We could do well to remember that today because in times of crisis, you need to remember where you've been, you need to see where you are, and you need to see who you want to be in the future. And in that regard, Marshall had one other extraordinary characteristic. He believed in the United States of America and its goodness. Today, there are many who question our goodness, and we have made our share of mistakes. But I do believe that, by and large, the United States of America has been a country that has tried to act on enlightened self-interest, really realizing that when others are safe and secure and free, we too are safer, more secure, and freer. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an argument that we are going to have to make over and over and over again to our fellow citizens because it fades with time that that is the true meaning of security, prosperity, and peace. And as to believing in America, well, yes, our country was born with a birth defect called slavery, and it marks us even to this day. 
But when we think about who we were, where we are now, and who we want to be, I always try to keep in my mind's eye some moment when I realized how far America had come. And for me, that was the day that I was sworn in as Secretary of State. I stood there in a building that George Marshall had once occupied. I stood there under a portrait of Benjamin Franklin. I stood there to be sworn in, taking an oath of office to a constitution that once counted my ancestors as three-fifths of a man. And I stood there to be sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court justice, my neighbor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For one minute, I thought, what would old Ben have thought of this? Well, he is my favorite founding father. I would like to think he would have liked it. But in fact, he would never have imagined it. And neither, frankly, would I have imagined it as a little girl growing up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm quite sure that Ruth, just trying to get her voice heard in law school, would never have imagined it either. And yet, there is that very special characteristic of the United States of America that we somehow seem to make the impossible seem inevitable in retrospect. That was the genius of George C. Marshall. It must have seemed impossible in 1947. It must have seemed impossible that friend and foe flattened by the horrors of World War II would emerge strong and vibrant pillars of security, prosperity, peace, and freedom. But that impossible did indeed come into being. But what we all need to remember is that actually it is not inevitable. It takes leadership and foresight and creativity. And that is what we celebrate in the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan and the legacy of George C. Marshall. Thank you very much. Andy, congratulations. That was fabulous. As somebody said back here, she killed it. And so our evening ends. Thank you all. I hope you had a good time. Thank you to the Marshall Foundation. Thank you to our gracious honorees. Go home tonight knowing you've shown honor to a good group and good people. See you next time. Good night. Hold on. Oh. Just one second. Just one second. I, I, I just have to, I have to give a, a few thanks because as eloquent a speech as I've ever heard, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe. That was amazing. But... I do owe thank you to our MC and tributor, uh, Pe Peggy Noonan, Gerald Beeson, Stephen Hadley. You helped make this evening very personal, which in turn made it very special. And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for being here tonight, recognizing two extraordinary individuals. And I think their remarks tonight speak for themselves. But I would ask you, sort of on a shameless note, here at the end. If you leave here moved by what you heard and thinking that the example of George C. Marshall is worth preserving, there are gift bags on your way out. And included in the treats is this little card. 
which will allow you to support the fine work that we do at the Marshall Foundation. I think it's important work, and um, I commend it to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude our evening tonight, please welcome once again Chaplain Phillips to offer our benediction. We have heard several quotes from General Marshall this evening, and I couldn't resist sharing one as part of our benediction tonight. In an address to Trinity College in 1941, General Marshall said, we have sought for something more than enthusiasm, something finer and higher than optimism or self-confidence, something not merely of, the, of intellect or emotions, but rather something in the spirit of man, something encompassed only in the soul. I pray that your soul has been lifted this evening. I pray that you depart here filled with hope, I pray that you are compelled with a higher calling and equipped to go and make a difference. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Go in peace. <laughs>